at issue. My question for the panel is... And I have two questions for the This is my question for at issue. I wonder if the panel could talk about... I want to ask about... My question is... It's that time of year as we wrap up 2020. What a year it's been. We did ask you for some of your questions to put to the at issue panel because there should be some some semblance of normalcy in this year. And so this is uh, this is how we're doing it. Joining me for one last time in 2020, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. OK, I'm going to try and whip through this as quickly as I can, you guys. The first question is from Ashish Basu. Have the Canadian federal provincial government its leaders, chief medical officers, shown leadership, vision, clarity, good decision-making in handling the COVID pandemic. Did they rely on science or on a populist agenda? Andrew, you can uh, start out on this one. Did they rely on science or a populist agenda? It's a mixed bag, but I would say mostly they relied on the science. I think elected officials have had a very difficult balancing act, as they see it anyway, between addressing the pandemic and also trying to keep their economies afloat. I think many people would say that's to some extent a false choice, but that's easy to say when you're not <laughs> in the office. But by and large, they've stuck to the science. And by and large, we've avoided some of the really crazy things we've seen in the States. I'll, I'll get everyone to do quickly on this one. Althea? I agree. I think they did the best with the information that they had. Um, I do think they could have been more communicative about what they knew and what they did know, but I think there was also part of, in the early outset, they wanted to make sure that we were calm and not panicked. Yeah. Um, on the populist agenda, I do think, and Andrew hinted at it, that they've been struggling with things that they want to get done, like reopening schools, but then not basically following the advice that they were given on how to open schools because they yeah. felt that those that was onerous or too expensive. So in some parts, it's, it's as Andrew said, a mixed bag. Yeah, and economic pressures too, or, or lobbying from certain parts of uh, inside the economy, Chantal? I wouldn't call reopening school a populist agenda. Uh, and, and yes, some of the things they could have done might have taken too long, but the notion that you can keep people locked up and kids away from school for nine or 10 months in the name of science uh, only will lead you to a lack of an audience for what you're asking people to do. So I think overall they did the best they could. Next question is from Liv Carlson. What is stopping the Prime Minister from invoking the Emergencies Act in regards to COVID-19? After nearly 10 months of this virus and over 10,000 Canadian lives lost, it's clear that many Canadians are failing to follow health regulations. When will the Prime Minister step in to say, enough is enough? Well, it was a hot topic through the spring, but it seems to have fallen by the wayside. Althea. Uh, he, I believe, will never impose the Emergencies Act. Uh, <laughs> we live in a federation. Yeah. Um, I think the consequences of imposing uh, that would be uh, disastrous for the Liberal government, frankly. Um, one thing that we can commend the government for doing is working collaboratively with the provinces, or at least trying to work collaboratively with the provinces. And a lot of the big things that Justin Trudeau wants done as prime minister involve the provinces, whether yeah. it's pharmacare or long-term care. And it, he does not want to annoy them. And uh, I don't believe that the government even sees a need for the Emergencies Act at this point. Yeah, Chantal, yep. Uh, I'm not sure what the expectation would be uh, that the Emergencies Act would suddenly make people listen more to popular premiers in Quebec uh, or in other, or BC or other areas of the country just because Justin Trudeau is using the Emergencies Act. I'm not even sure that it would be particularly efficient, but I do note that I have not noticed, maybe I missed it, a single a uh, public health officer in any province, a uh, leader of the opposition, leader of a third party or premier calling on the federal government to use, uh, yeah. or even an opposition party in the House of Commons calling yeah. on the government uh, in Ottawa to use the Emergencies Act. And for good reason, it, 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 there is no magic in that box. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to try and clip through another question. Mary Ellen Perkis, this one will be for you, Andrew. A question about long-term care. I wonder if the panel could talk about how likely they think it is that we'll see an agreement between the federal and provincial governments instituting standards that ensure quality of care for seniors living in long-term care. Andrew? Uh, we may see an agreement. The agreement may not uh, contain a whole lot. Uh, there'll be a lot of provincial resistance to this. On the other hand, people will want to be looking like they're being cooperative. I could imagine some sort of agreement that didn't really matter, mean a whole lot, uh, but would involve the feds transferring some funds. 
Uh, our next question is from Maya Pajevich. Here we go. What lessons have we learned from this year and how will that help us when dealing with the next pandemic? Althea, do you want to tackle that one? Uh, it's best to overreact in dealing with the pandemic than to underreact, I would say. <laughs> best, best to be prepared. If you're not prepared, throw everything you can, uh, which is what the government has done. And I think that uh, public opinion polls show that uh, across the country, not just at the federal level, that um, the premiers are seeing a, a, most premiers are seeing a bump in their numbers because of it. Okay, uh, this one will be, well, we'll see who, uh, if we can get everybody in. But a question from Dominic Cava about Alberta's handling of the pandemic. This one will be for you, Chantal. Premier Jason Kenney's poll numbers are dropping due to his handling of the coronavirus pandemic. What should he do to recover? Or will his actions hurt his government's re-election chances? What do you think, Chantal? Uh, Jason Kenney under, uh, has been under some pressure throughout this. He's now put some yes. restrictions in place. What do you think? Yes, he is the, the premier who gets the poorest mark from his own voters on his handling of the pandemic. Um, I think it's too early to assess what that does to his election prospects. Mm -hmm. But I do note that uh, Jason Kenney uh, set aside the pandemic, campaigned on the notion that he had uh, answers that involved taking on Ottawa to solve Alberta's problems. They happen to be much more complex uh, than just uh, Justin Trudeau being the prime minister. And I suspect that may drag him down over the long term as much as his handling of the pandemic. What, what do you think, Andrew, about uh, uh, Jason Kenney and, and how he's managed things? Uh, I agree with Chantal. He, he's been dealt a very poor hand. Uh, whether he's played it terribly well is another question. But uh, not only has I, I, do, I do think that they were too lax in, in the early going, particularly in their imposition of restrictions in Alberta. Uh, but longer term, as Chantal said, that they're facing a uh, existential question in terms of their main uh, uh, resource, their main source of livelihoods. Um, and that's going to be hard for any premier to play. And it's, it's you can blame Ottawa, but even if you had a different uh, government in Ottawa, that's not going to solve some of the fundamental problems uh, facing that industry and facing the province. I mean, it's so, I mean, when you think about sort of where we were at this time last year after the election, thinking about Western alienation, not to say that it's still not a present uh, issue, but where we are now and what Jason Kenney is, is trying to deal with now, Althea, just it's sort of mind boggling how quickly some of that has changed. Well, I mean, I think the pandemic changed everybody's priorities. I still think Western separation is an issue. Um, it may be a dormant issue, uh, but it's still an issue. I don't think the pandemic changes that. And I agree with both of what um, Andrew and Chantal said. I think it's way too early to think that the NDP is only going to sweep into power in Alberta because of Jason Kenney's management of the crisis. Welcome back to another round of At Issue. We're taking your questions for the last panel of this year. Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj all joining us uh, from their homes, of course, where everybody is this year. Here's Parmdeep Gill with his question. I want to ask about Bill C-7. Why Parliament is not working together to pass this bill unanimously, um, which is uh, of great importance to many Canadians? So as we record this, uh, the, the government has now received an extension on this bill until uh, February to respond to, to the, the, the Superior Court decision in Quebec. Uh, Chantal, I think a lot of people were frustrated that um, it, it couldn't get dealt with, but it is a, a serious issue. Your thoughts on that? Uh, we should possibly say for those who don't live in the parliamentary bubble that C7 deals with yes. uh, medically assisted uh, death. I am not too surprised that it's taking longer. I don't think that this is the kind of matter where you are well served by your parliament by having a unanimous view on the issue, as it is a serious issue that brings a lot of different perspectives together. So bottom line, I, I am not disturbed by the notion that parliament is taking the time that it takes yeah. to debate an issue of that nature. Yeah, you you pointed out in a previous panel that this is now the third extension Parliament's got. I'm, I'm surprised they got another one, but perhaps, Andrew, that does speak to the, the, the complex nature of this and the fact that it, it's going to take some time. 
Yeah, I mean, the questioner asked why it wasn't passed unanimously, given it's so important to so many Canadians. And the answer is it's so important to so many Canadians. <laughs> That's right. But there are people of goodwill on both sides of this who have very yeah. deep con yeah. concerns. There are people yeah. who want to alleviate the suffering of those nearing the end of life or with interminable, con intolerable conditions of life. And there are people who are very worried, such as I am, that, that this is going to normalize suicide and it's going to leave a lot of vulnerable pe people exposed. Uh, so it behooves all of us to take the time and debate it thoroughly and get it right. Althea. Well, it wasn't passed unanimously because there is not unanimous agreement between MPs, yeah. let alone polit within political parties, yes, yes. about uh, this bill. And this is the second version of this bill um, because the court told uh, Parliament that um, it didn't strike the right balance the first time. And the first time we had this discussion, there were a lot of people, including the current Justice Minister, um, yeah. who felt that the first version of the bill did not go far enough. Um, and so I think it is wise for our parliamentarians to take the time needed uh, to study this bill and to amend it uh, when there is enough uh, discussion to get an agreement to amend the bill uh, as we see fit. If there were all, if all the bills were passed unanimously, you kind of wonder what the point of parliament was. <laughs> what were they all doing? Yes, yeah, it's a good question though on an important issue. Okay, lots of questions obviously about the timing of the next election. Here's Matthew Enright with this. There seems to be a general feeling that there will be an election sometime in the new year. With that in mind, what do you think is the likelihood that the Prime Minister will opt to pull the plug on Parliament sooner rather than later? Okay, all three of you uh, will get a chance to answer this. Don't worry, Chantal. Uh, I don't uh, for a second believe that the, the Prime Minister will pull the plug on Parliament in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so I think it's off the table for the winter. I also believe that if it comes to that for a late spring election, a budget will come first that the Liberals will feel confident to campaign on and yeah. that the opposition parties will feel that they can't support. Andrew, what do you think? I'll just pause to note that we have a fixed election date law <laughs> in this country. But it's a little disturbing that we all just yeah. kind of pass lightly over that, that the yes. Prime Minister could just pull the plug, quote unquote, uh, yes, the legislation has that loophole in it, but the expectation was and should be that when governments pass legislation like that, it has some meaning. That being said, I, I think it may to some extent have some bearing on his decision making that he would, for that and other reasons, would prefer to, to be defeated in Parliament yes. uh, rather than just simply up and go to the, the Governor General on his own. Uh, and as Chantel said, it may well be that the budget is the occasion for that. But remember the arithmetic of, of these things. The government only needs the support of one party to stay in power, which means all three of the major opposition parties have to vote together to bring it down. And they rarely see it in their simultaneous interest to do so. Yeah, they really, they all uh, have but, to really uh, hate something. Yes, yes, Chantal. Uh, but do remember the two minority governments in this country, New Brunswick and uh, B.C., had the premiers call an election, not be defeated, and were rewarded for doing that with yes. the majority yeah. government. Althea. So I actually think it's possible after the budget is tabled for the prime minister to walk over to the Rideau Hall and ask the governor general to dissolve parliament and say, listen, when we were elected in 2019, we were facing a very different situation. I want to spend $100 billion more, and I believe I need a mandate from the public to do that. Um, that being said, I, I think... It's going to be hard for the opposition to defeat the government because I feel like the NDP has no incentive to defeat the Liberals. Yeah. They've never been in a sweeter spot in terms of negotiating tactics. The other thing is, when you look at the electoral map, it's actually kind of hard to see where the Liberals get a majority with the polling numbers that they now have. So um, it will be interesting to see in the coming months if the polling numbers go up to a point in areas that matter to them or if their electoral strategy is clear enough that they can swing some of the tight seats that they um, that they lost last election. But in fact, they were really efficient with their vote in 2019. Yeah. And they won most of the seats that were in tight races. So um, uh, what's the point of calling an election to get another minority government? It, yeah, it's a gamble. It's a gamble. OK, listen, thanks, everybody. Thanks for um, thanks for a good year, even though it's been a it's a it's been a terrible year. <laughs> but uh, having you with us has helped. And I'll see you back here in 2021. Here's to a here's to a better year soon. Thank you.